morning. I know it's been a long time, but today I'm getting back to the Ancient Pottery Challenge. I've made myself that Maverick Mountain Polychrome Pot, and I'm out here to fire it this morning. So what I want to do is send you back about four days and over to my studio in Tucson so that you can see how I built the pot. And then come back here and I'll show you how I fired it. Don't worry, I won't start firing until you get back. If you're hoping to follow along, here are the basic tools you're gonna need to do this part of the process, forming the pot. That and some basic wild harvested clay, which I have here. And you just start by patting out a nice slab of clay. I usually shoot for about a quarter inch thickness. Not only does this make a strong, lightweight pot, but it saves a lot of clay. If you make a thick pot, you're gonna go through a lot more clay. And when you're harvesting your own clay, that equals more work. Always take a little extra time to make sure you get the base all set up right before you start building those walls with coils. And the reason for that is, once you've got that pot built, it can be really hard to work on the bottom without misshaping the pot. So now is the time really to get that bottom cleaned up and uh, set up the way you want it. Now I don't always do this, but sometimes when I've kind of made some mistakes on the bottom or I've added extra bits in once I had it in the pookie, uh, I like to flip it over, pull the pookie off and kind of clean the bottom up before I go on. And so in this case, uh, I just wasn't sure that the bottom wasn't a mess under there full of cracks. And so uh, once I have it all cleaned up, I can feel confident that the bottom is ready and I'm not gonna have to worry about it until quite a bit later. Here's a picture of what the 700 plus year old pot that I'm recreating today looks like. This was found in a cave along Bonita Creek near the Gila River in southeastern Arizona. I'll talk more about the people that made this later on. So now I'm just going to start coiling those walls up using my basic technique, which is coil, bond, pinch, scrape the outside, scrape the inside, repeat as necessary. Just my basic coil and scrape technique which I've gone into great detail on previous videos. I've recently been given access to the notes from a retired potter who spent years making primitive pottery, who prefers to go unnamed. And it's been really eye-opening to me, even though his pottery is in many ways quite a bit different from my own, to read those notes, to go through the process with him, uh, making the pottery, firing the pottery, uh, you know, mixing the paints, all the same sorts of things I do. And one of my main takeaways from these notes is just that precision in primitive pottery is vastly overrated. The thing to remember about primitive pottery is there are a lot of variables at play. Uh, variables, you know, related to the quality of your clay or the temper, related to the atmosphere that you're making it in, related to uh, the materials and uh, the firing atmosphere, all, there's just so many variables at play. Which is why, no matter how hard we try, this pottery always comes out a little different than we expect, or it doesn't fire quite right, or uh, it cracked here mysteriously, I can't figure out why that happened. So this retired potter I've been telling you about, he was very precise. He kept careful notes, he made the same clay every time, he made his paint according to a set recipe. This many grams of this, this many grams of that. He fired precisely the same, kept careful notes about how he fired and tried to repeat those successful firings. And even then, he had quite a bit of variance in there. This firing came out grayer. This one oxidized too much. This one, the pot cracked. There's just always those variables in this type of pottery. That really what life was like before the Industrial Revolution. And no matter how good in notes we keep, no matter how precise we are in our process, we just can't remove that from the process. It's part of it. So my message to you is embrace the wonkiness because in the end, no matter how hard you try, it's impossible to escape it. What in the world is that deer rib? I had it here recently. 
Okay, now that the pot has dried up enough to be firm, and believe me, here in Tucson in the spring, everything is drying up really fast. Uh, it's ready to be cleaned up a little. So I'm just using this deer rib to scrape the pot down, especially that little lip around the edge of the pookie. So once I'm done scraping, I kind of left with a rough texture, and then I'm gonna use a wet stone to just go over it, like troweling concrete, just smooth it out. And then little dabs of wet clay stuffed in any holes, and then go over that again with the smooth stone, just to leave me with a nice, smooth, outside of the pot, ready to take some slip. And then of course, I'll flip it over and do the other side as well. I've decided to slip this pot with my Bear Springs Yellow, which is kind of a ochreous clay, a clayey ochre uh, that I get up on the Mogollon Rim. And I actually discovered this in a video I made a couple years ago. So I'll link that up above and in the doobly-doo if you're interested. And I'm just hydrating this and then I'll come back the next day and apply it. A group of people used to live in North Central Arizona that archeologists called the Cayenta Anazazi. They built amazing stone pueblos and beautiful polychrome pottery. Around 1275, because of something that archeologists have not so far been able to quite put their finger on, something caused these people to start moving out of their homeland, to start leaving in droves. They traveled hundreds of miles south into southeastern Arizona, where the same pottery types that had been made up in north central Arizona suddenly start being made using different materials, those clays and minerals that are available in Southeast Arizona, but constructed in the same way, using the same designs. This new type of pottery, this Cayenta pottery made in Southeast Arizona, archeologists call Maverick Mountain Polychrome. And that is what this pot I'm recreating today is. This little pot was made by immigrants, pilgrims in a strange land sometime around 1300 AD. It's the next day, my pot is leather hard, ready to be slipped. My slip is all hydrated, ready to go, about the color of a school bus, school bus yellow, or maybe like the stripes in the middle of a highway, road stripe yellow. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this stuff isn't really pure clay, it's kind of ochre and clay. So it's really important once you get it applied that you spend some time polishing it. And that's gonna set those particles down into that still damp clay surface and make sure that they don't kind of come off after firing, that it doesn't end up being a little fugitive. So my choice of slips here, although it looks really nice and bright now, is doesn't turn out to be really the best, uh, as you'll see later on in this video. In my memory, this stuff fires bright red. In reality, it wasn't quite as bright as I'd hoped. You know, for a pot that came out, you know, pretty darn good, uh, this was kind of the one slip up, was this uh, school bus yellow, this Bear Springs yellow, I probably should have chosen a different slip. I start painting day by selecting the yucca leaf paintbrushes that I want to use and then putting them in my water bowl so they can start kind of hydrating. If you soak the brushes you're gonna use ahead of time, then they'll soften up and be more pliable. The mineral paint recipe I'm using today is equal parts, manganese dioxide, copper carbonate, and clay, and a little bit of mesquite sap as a binder. And this brings me back to the discussion about precision. I was talking earlier about this retired potter and how he was very careful in mixing his clays and his paints according to set recipes. And even with all that care and precision, he still got a lot of variation. And it was clear to me in reading through those notes that the same was true in firing as much as it was in paint recipes. That no matter how careful you were to mix the paint exactly the same as last time, you may or may not get the same results due to small variations in the material or even in how you mixed it or something. There's just so many variables at play here. In this regard, pottery has a lot of parallels with cooking. Cooking also is not super precise, or it shouldn't be. Sure, there's some recipes where precision is really important to get it right. And the same is true with pottery. I'm sure there's some glaze recipes that you have to get the ingredients just the right proportions or it doesn't work out right. But in most cases, it's not necessary. When was the last time you followed a recipe for cooking in which it called for 
two and a quarter cups and also a half a teaspoon. The reason recipes aren't written that way is because you can be a half a teaspoon either way and it's not going to make that much difference. And the same goes for pottery, which is why I always give my recipes in ratios. Uh, three scoops of this and one scoop of that, those kind of things, because it translates to other countries where people use different measuring, and it's as precise as you need it to be without being overly precise. And I feel that's really closer to the way the ancient potters worked anyway. Hey, I thought I'd pop in here really fast and give you an update. I just finished painting all the black designs on the pot. And I know when you're watching a video like this, it's heavily edited because, believe me, it would bore you to death if you saw every minute of it. But beyond that, I wanted to kind of give you an idea of the passage of time. I started this this morning. This was my project for the day. I started first thing this morning. So I did some work on the computer and got out here maybe 9.30, 10 o'clock at the latest. Um, so I've, I've literally, you know, and lots of breaks because this makes me kind of edgy, uh, you know, painting. Uh, but I've been at this all day and it's after four. So just so you know, uh, I've literally been working on painting this all day and it's, you know, pushing five o'clock. Uh, I still have the white to do though. So this is just the black on the yellow, which of course is going to be red and I still have to do the white. So uh, I also wanted to show you a little trick that a friend of mine told me. So here is my white clay slip that I've been using recently and it's, it's a little dried up, uh, not bad, but I have a friend who swears by the idea that a white clay slip is gonna work a lot better, or any clay slip is gonna lay down a lot better if uh, you add some tea to it. Uh, so I did some research and the tannins in the tea can act as a deflocculant. It, I believe how it works. Anyway, I brewed up a really strong half a cup of tea and I'm gonna pour some of that into this white clay. The problem is when you try to paint with pure clay, it wants to kind of, you know, cause a little lump. It wants to kind of stick together, it'll make a raised area on the pot, which can then easily get flaked off. What you want is for that clay to lay really flat on the pot. So hopefully uh, this strong tea will help it do that. If you want to get started making primitive pottery, you need to just take the time and do it. Just jump in. You don't necessarily have to do it alone. The Ancient Potters Club meets every Wednesday night. It's a community of people making primitive pottery together, sharing knowledge, sharing information, sharing our successes and failures. The link is on the screen and in the doobly-doo in case you're interested. Welcome back. I've got my primary fire going on here. This is just preheating the pot, building that bed of coals. It's just about done. When that fire is all burned down to coals, I'm gonna stack the pot over that, stack the wood around it, and we're gonna get it fired. Today I'm working with a couple of limitations. For one thing, I don't have enough cover sherds to cover it. So when you're firing a polychrome pot like this, it's good to try to keep the fuel off the top of the pot because every place that fuel, that wood touches the pottery, is gonna leave a black mark, a fire cloud. So usually you would cover it with broken bits of pottery, what we call cover sherds, to keep that from happening. I have a few, but I don't have enough to cover this really accurately. And so I brought a bucket. I brought a galvanized bucket to cover it with, which is going to act as cover sherds. Now it's not authentic, but it'll do the job given that I don't have enough cover sherds. My other limitation is I usually measure the temperature of the pot in the fire using my infrared thermometer. And last time I was out here, my infrared thermometer, the battery went out. Today, on my way out here this morning, I stopped by the store and I bought a new battery. But I found out when I got out here that I need a really small screwdriver in order to pull that off and replace the battery, and I don't have it with me. So again, I have no way of measuring the temperature. Now, there's, there's other ways to kind of estimate the temperature based on what I'm seeing in the fire, and it's going to be okay, but I would have liked to have known how hot I got this fire. So let's get this fired and see how it comes out. So when you're firing in the open like this, the number one thing to keep in mind, especially with polychrome, is airflow. And when I got out here with this bucket, I realized that it's almost too small for the pot. It's a pretty tight fit. So I was worried about airflow, and I didn't want that bucket sitting right down on the bottom of the pot. I wanted to have room for that air to circulate all the way around the bottom so that I could oxidize that surface well. 
And given the size of the bucket, I had to prop it up, as you saw, on stones, which is another problem because if one of those stones decides to break or crack during the firing, uh, then it could cause the bucket and even some of the wood to fall down you know, closer to the top of the pot and then I wouldn't get good oxidation. So I was a little bit nervous about it. Uh, I think in a perfect world, it would have had maybe some steel stakes or something to kind of hold that bucket up in that position and not had to use stones. But it is what it is. Uh, the firing actually went really well. I had no way of measuring the temperature, of course, but it got plenty hot. And it was a little breezy, but the breeze kept changing direction. So there wasn't like a downwind side. It really got well oxidized all the way around, which is what I was hoping for. All right, let's talk a little bit about how we did here today. Uh, the pot came out really good. Everything I like about it, the shape, uh, the build, the firing, the paint. Uh, rings like a bell, so we know that there's no cracks or anything in it. Uh, it's a really nice pot. The one thing I would say is that red didn't come out quite as red as I'd hoped. So this slip is a type I call Bear Springs Yellow, and it's not a slip I use all the time. And in my memory, I remembered it coming out a lot redder the last time I used it. But that could be just, you know, faulty memory. I have two different yellow slips that I use, and now that I'm looking at it, I'm thinking I probably should have used the other one. But at any rate, it is what it is, and it is a nice pot. I just wish the red was a little brighter than what it is. Now, if you don't know what the Ancient Pottery Challenge is, that's that list of seven pots from the ancient Southwest that I'm gonna replicate this season. And you can make the same pots, upload the picture to Instagram with the hashtag Ancient Pottery Challenge, and then when I'm done, I'll share my pots as well as everybody else's here on this channel. So if you're interested in getting started, take a crack at this pot and upload it to Instagram. I look forward to seeing your work. Now this video right here is the one where I go out and make a road trip across the Southern Southwest and talk about those seven different cultures and select those seven different pots that I'm gonna make. So go watch that, learn more about the Ancient Pottery Challenge. I appreciate you coming on my adventure with me today. I'll catch you next time.